welcome, Ron Siegel. It's good to have you here. And we were just chatting off the air about how there's so much overlap between ACT and Buddhism. And you were just interviewing Stephen Hayes. Yeah, it was it was a very exciting interview. Uh, it was, I, I forget exactly which summit it was for. It was either for one on psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or expanded uh, states of consciousness. But uh, given the topic, it pulled for those aspects, uh, him talking about those aspects of his work that are um, uh, that move in in transpersonal directions and uh, that are about embracing love as a as a guiding principle. Mm-hmm. That's what it really boils down to when you can kind of sort through all the the hexaflex and the <laughs> processes and the relational frame theory. It really does boil down to love as that core. Uh, foundation of act and also transcending of the self, which is a lot of what your work is about. And in particular, what I'm hoping we can talk about today is um, the extraordinary gift of being ordinary. So why is why is being ordinary a gift? Um, this really began as a self-treatment project. Uh, I had spent some, I, I was I was in my early 60s when I came up with this idea. And I had spent literally four decades or more involved in pretty serious meditation practices in largely uh, Buddhist frameworks, secular Buddhist frameworks, but nonetheless, um, uh, Buddhist frameworks that have as their object, or at least one of their objects, to get over oneself, right? To, to transcend preoccupation with ego, with self-evaluation, with how I'm doing, and to cultivate wisdom and compassion. And I spent at least as much time working as a clinical psychologist, uh, in my own therapy when I was younger and and then working with many, many uh, clients or patients over the years. And you would think that out of all of this, I might have developed something like a coherent, consistent, secure sense of self, but nothing of this sort had occurred. Uh, it was quite clear to me because I have a mindfulness practice. So I tend to watch or or experience with with some clarity what's what's going on in my heart and mind on a moment to moment basis. And my feelings about myself were regularly fluctuating and noticing these kinds of, you know, fluctuations, you know, professionally, personally, you know, looking at myself in the mirror, doing something athletic, whatever it might be, you know, either feeling good about myself or bad about myself. So I, it got me interested in, okay, what's going on here? There's something quite universal about this because after all, I was seeing it similar kinds of fluctuations in virtually all the people I work with professionally. Um, And there's something very robust about this tendency in the human heart, mind, and brain to get stuck in social comparison, to get stuck in narratives about evaluating ourselves and to feel either good or bad about ourselves. And we put a lot of energy into that. And most of us wind up either feeling down in the dumps, you know, I'm not good enough, or stressed out trying to stay on top of our game, right? Stressed out trying to accomplish things, prove ourselves in some way. And everybody's got different criteria, different things that, that we get hooked on. But, but the tendency to be concerned with how we're, do, we're doing is kind of universal. So I started thinking and investigating, you know, what do we know about this? What do we know about this from the point of view of uh, science, evolutionary psychology, uh, uh, clinical uh, investigations and the like. What do we know about this from spiritual traditions? And how might I inch a little bit toward freedom in the years that I've got left and in the process maybe help other people do it? And it turns out that one very useful approach is embracing our ordinariness and our common humanity. Mm-hmm. So I was reading the New York Times last night and you know how AI kind of chooses what articles you you read. And the two, two articles showed up in my feed. And one was um, how to feel better naked. And the other was, uh, I can't continue this fight any longer. How a basketball player uh, from Stanford who went on to go to, on to the NBA was quitting. So here are these two things that are coming up in my feed. One is how to feel better naked. How many people are going to click on that? <clears throat> and then the other is the success story who's quitting. And how many of us are going to click on that? Because we also feel miserable at the points of our success and the stress of success, right? Obviously, those were chosen for me because what I've clicked on before, or I have kids that play basketball, who knows, but that perfect combination. And the the solution of ordinariness is, is 
kind of a solution to both of those. Yeah. Right. If you want to feel better naked, get used to having a, a body that's pretty ordinary in its weirdness. If you go and like hang out at the YMCA in the locker room, you'll see all sorts of bodies. Right. And then also the emptiness that and not Buddhist emptiness, but more like falseness the, of, of feeling successful that doesn't really satisfy yeah. us and creates so much stress. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things that, that we start to notice when we turn our attention, or at least I start to notice in turning my attention to these matters, is that um, we absolutely can't win at this game. And uh, I think there are two reasons we can't win at it. Uh, one of them we might call uh, narcissistic or self-esteem recalibration, right? The things that once floated our boat don't work anymore. Um, many of us remember a childhood toy that's a series of concentric um rings kind of like donuts that, that fit on a, a pole and in they're in various sizes and different colors. And the object is to arrange them so they look like a cone or a Christmas tree. Right. And yeah, there was a time where doing that, hey, look, mommy, hey, look, daddy, I did it. This is great. And they smiled and I, and I felt great about myself. Right. Uh, there may be a time coming forward in the skilled nursing facility where, again, that feels like a comp an accomplishment. But at the moment, you know, that that doesn't, uh, you know, float my boat anymore. What happens is we keep recalibrating. We habituate to everything, and then we start to need something more. I, I once had um, had a chance to hang out with a uh, a British psychiatrist who was um, kind of psychiatrist to a lot of well known British rock bands. In fact, he would tour with them, and when they'd get in trouble with drugs, he'd try to come up with a cocktail to pull them out of it. Right? That's what he did. And I asked him, you know, do is it just my perception, or do a lot of these rock stars who are super successful crash and burn like disproportionately more so than 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 just ordinary folks he said absolutely you know they you know they they keep going for the next level of success they get to the top of their game and then when they start feeling like it's not enough or this isn't working for me i'm still starting to, they don't they you know they're terribly disoriented and they don't know where to turn and sometimes you know they turn to substance use difficulties so it's uh, so we so the first is because we recalibrate as we move through life and if we move up we just get used to a new layer we can't win and the second one is well it goes up goes down you know this is the newtonian problem right let's say you're at the total top of your game you're an olympic gold medalist what are the chances of winning the gold in 4 years Maybe in eight, not so likely, right? So you know things fluctuate. Everything is 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 going to change, and everything that we gain, we're going to lose. So because of this, even though this this um, it is so addictive, we get so addicted to trying to feel better about ourselves. Um, it's doomed to failure. Well, there's a reason why someone like Leonard Cohen went up to the Los Angeles mountains <laughs> to a Zen center. <laughs> And said he felt the best he ever felt when he was yeah. up there living so simply, right? It was actually freedom probably from him from that yeah. roller coaster ride of success. And um, we hear about that certainly with, with big, successful, high achievers, how they feel dissatisfied. Hi, I'm Dr. Diana Hill. Thank you so much for joining me with Your Life in Process. And if you want more, if you're interested in applying these processes to your daily life, join me at my membership, More Life in Process. At More Life in Process, you will get meditations for you to practice at home. You'll get extra bits from the episode that maybe got recorded after the fact. You're going to get PDFs and handouts, things that you can use to apply your daily practice to your life. And I can't wait to see you there. $5 a month, $50 for the year. You can go to yourlifeinprocess.com to sign up. Um, and there's the, there's the big accomplishments. I, I uh, supervise a postdoc and watching her go through each one of these, you know, getting the each real P examination done and the, the good feeling of having that offer back, but then it's just the next exam. And then eventually you're kind of there. Like what, what more are you going <laughs> to, there's no more tests to take. There's no more finish lines to pass. And then you're in your, you're in your life, you're in your practice. Right. But there's also the small addictions to self that I think are people resonate with. And the, especially with social media and this, this over, um, selfing that we can do all day long. We can check in and see how we're doing yeah. all day long on our phone. Like, and, and the, the boost that we feel when 
something gets a lot of likes and then the drop that we feel when something doesn't get a lot of likes. I recently, uh, I am a beekeeper and my husband had come to the door with this cool uh, comb from our, from our hive. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then we brought it in and we cut it up and mashed it up. And I was like, I'm going to video this. This is so cool. And I just put it up on, uh, on social media, just thinking this is kind of an interesting thing. The, this weird beekeeping video went viral. Mm. <laughs> I've been working so hard at these, you know, insightful psychology, you know, psychological act posts where I'm getting the wording right. And this is just some random moment in our day that was like, that was kind of cool. Thousands and thousands more views than anything, anything else I've ever posted. And it's nothing that could ever be recreated because in some ways it was just sort of kind of extraordinarily ordinary. Right. I mean, bees are doing this all the time. Right. So how do we deal with that? Like the, the well, aspect of selfing that is coming from social media and the, that we get. You know, the, the origin story to that um, is, you know, here in my neighborhood at Harvard, right? There was this uh, young undergraduate in the early days of the internet who came up with this idea of uh, taking pictures of other undergraduates that were available in the university um, uh, intranet series, you know, the, the internal series. And he wound up posting these and basically asking people to rate the, his fellow students on attractiveness. Right. And this thing took off like crazy. And uh, it, it, it took uh, about four days before the authorities at Harvard um, uh, shut it down and began the process of expelling Mark Zuckerberg because he had invented Face Mash, which was at, at Harvard and later became Facebook because he hit on the genius of realizing that people will become totally addicted to getting a like to getting mm -hmm. reposted, to getting, uh, you know, to going viral, to having this kind of um, attention. And uh, scientists have looked at this in scanners and indeed the nucleus accumbens, which is a reward center of the brain, gets extremely activated every time that we get some kind of positive feedback from social media. And the, the key to this is just how addicting that this is. Um, if, if I can invite you and, and our, our viewers to do just a, a quick little exercise, um, which is to think of something that tends to either make you feel good or bad about yourself, you know, whether it be intelligence or appearance or feeling like a kind person or getting respect or feeling um, uh, generous, it, you know, could be anything, some that we think of as more wholesome than others. Um, but, you know, something that sometimes makes you feel good about yourself. And remember the last time that that got validated and you got to feel good about yourself and how that felt in the body, right? What's that experience of a really self-esteem boost? And at least for me, you know, I sit up a little bit taller, my chest, you know, comes out a little bit and, you know, I feel competent and good in the world and like other people are going to like or respect me, it feels really good. And it's very powerful. It, I mean, it's very, it's very palpable. You can really feel it. Um, and then, you know, enjoy that for a moment because it's not going to last, right? Uh, you know, now, you know, uh, imagine or recall the opposite, right? A moment where, you know, if it was intelligence, where you felt dumb, if it was attractiveness, where you felt, you know, ugly, where, you know, if it was kindness, where you felt you were selfish, but that kind of collapse feeling, right? The self-esteem collapse and and here you know i'm sort of exaggerating it you know shoulders forward belly collapse if i were a dog i'd have the t my tail between my legs very painful state very unpleasant state and there's one thing we both know as as psychologists that whenever there is a very sharp contrast between something that brings a very good feeling and something that brings a very bad feeling it's ripe for addiction right mm -hmm. Crack cocaine feels really, really good when you smoke it, feels really, really bad a few minutes later when it wears off. And so we become so addicted to this stuff because it's a physical sense of well-being and a physical sense of, of distress. And in the moments of the self-esteem boost, it kind of wipes out all of the failure. Okay, okay, I'm no longer being you know, picked last for the kickball team in the third grade. That's gone because somebody thought I was smart, right? Or somebody thought I was, you know, funny or what, you know, whatever it might be. And 
so we become so addicted to this stuff. And, you know, anybody who's watched The Social Dilemma or any of these um, exposés of how social media is constructed, there are very smart people that have created very powerful algorithms that, uh, that further addict us to this stuff. The first step, as I understand it, is recognize it. Actually see yourself going up and down. Actually see the addictive pull. We start with simply being mindful of, oh my God, this is a toxic wasteland. It's social media, but, but it can be other things. It could be grades. It could be uh, making money. It can sometimes, when you, were, when you said, think about something that makes you feel good about yourself, I um, brought up, I was thinking just something simple because it's in my background. It's like, oh, my flowers. I always have fresh flowers in my office. And it's something that I've been doing ever since I was a beginner therapist because it was something that brought me well-being, a feeling of like fresh aliveness, right, in my, in my office. And it also kind of started to get, I'd get compliments. Oh, I love your flowers. Some mm -hmm. people notice, half the people don't even notice, but some people that are flower people like me, they notice, oh, I love your flowers. Oh, and they make a compliment. Oh, you have Gerber daisies today. Oh, you have blah, blah, blah. And if you, if you catch me on the wrong day, you'll see me shuffling about my office, like running around trying to get rid of the dead flowers. Where can I go pick some new fresh flowers? <laughs> Oh, no, I don't have any flowers, right? What are people going to think about me? Oh, no, this client's coming and she commented on my flowers last time. And something as simple as having flowers in your office, we can get, it gets co-opted. And it, what, what's hard about it is something that can start off like this uh, basketball player, something that can start off is actually something you genuinely enjoy. You genuinely enjoy having flowers in your office or playing basketball gets hijacked into the selfing of yeah. now I'm doing it to get somebody else's praise or approval or be part of. Yeah. And that that's the tricky part because when you talk about ordinariness, uh, there is also something about, it's kind of cool to have things that are different about you or extraordinary, or I mean, to be, have an eye for flowers or to be an yeah. amazing basketball player and your natural talents that, uh, and so it's how do we celebrate those without getting hooked? Well, it's, you know. it, it, it's, it's, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, it, it, it has to do with which motivational system we want to cultivate in ourselves mm -hmm. as human beings, right? Um, our brains evolved for survival and they evolved with, there are a number of different motivational systems that contribute to that. Those who were dominant or who were hanging around with the dominant ones had a better chance at passing on their DNA. So we're not going to make this go away. Because it, it is precisely that um, mammalian, avian, even insect-based uh, um, propensity that shows up with our self-esteem preoccupation. We are always looking at other people and always trying to get a sense of how am I doing compared to them? And if we're not doing it with other people, we're doing it with internalized images of how we think we're supposed to be right? Like, well, I'm supposed to be this kind of person or that kind of person. And am I, how do I compare to that idealized image of how I'm supposed to be? So it, it is actually quite helpful to realize that it's not going away. You know, this is, this is a very fundamental system. And the same way we're never going to not feel thirsty when we, when we haven't had something to drink. And we're probably never going to not have any interest at all in fat and sugar. At least most of us won't, you know, because once upon a time there was, you know, fat and sugar meant nutrients. And that's why the donut is the most perfect food in terms of, you know, attracting our interest and, and, and attention. But what we can learn is the same way that we learn that just doubling down on this and eating donuts all day long makes us feel kind of sick. We can learn that, oh, trying to get the good feeling that comes from winning in this arena. And it's not always, you know, winning can simply mean thinking I'm a good person or I have beautiful flowers, right? Uh, not a bad thing to have beautiful flowers or not a bad thing to act like a good person in the world. But, but we're never going to not get attached to it um, to some degree. But the more we can see it, the more we can understand it, and the more we can get that it's like the donuts, you know, okay, it's fine, you know, but doubling down on this is not going to be helpful, the freer we can get. And we can begin to see that there are other instincts that we also evolve, because we're also luckily a cooperative species. We're also a species that in which there was survival um, um, benefit to sharing 
to being just with one another. And that brings us to some very powerful antidotes uh, to these instincts, most of which involve establishing safe social connection as very ordinary human beings. Mm -hmm. All of that reminded me of, um, just brought to mind the, Fran the Franz de Waal study mm -hmm. of the, um, it, they, I think they play this a lot in like psychology classes or they play it in um, like, uh, co you know, conferences when someone's trying to demonstrate comparison of the capuchin monkeys where these two monkeys that know each other are in, pair, you know, cages right next to each other. And the researcher gives them both a cucumber if they give them a stone. So the monkey gives the stone to the researcher, the monkey gets a cucumber. But then one of the monkeys starts to get a grape. And where the cucumber was fine before, the monkey that's observing their friend get a grape gets really mad and starts throwing the stone at the researcher, starts knocking it on the wall. Like, what's wrong with this stone? Why isn't it giving me a grape? And that that there's always like sort of this, there's something we compare ourselves and then somebody else has something better. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden what we have is is not good enough. And then that leads to that that cycle of dissatisfaction. So whatever is your cucumber that was quite tasty and good enough, and that could be our bodies or it could be our achievements or our jobs or whatever, we now want grapes. And then if, yeah. if they gave that, you know, that monkey a piece of cake, the grape would be old news. <laughs> They're very, very powerful um instincts that we that we have around this uh, but the really good news is it is possible to inch toward freedom not you know not to get these things to go away entirely not without some kind of massive spiritual bypass where oh i don't compare myself to anybody else the propensity is going to come up but we can take it more lightly and we can put energy into other things that are um that are just far more reliable pathways to well-being so the first part is to notice your ups and downs of your well-being based on uh, these sort of self-evaluations, you know. And then the second part that you that you write about has to do with really asking yourself, am I doing this to make myself feel better or am I doing this for another reason, which may be a more pro-social reason or a, a reason that's bigger than just about you. And that is some of the exit ramp being able yeah. to shift the the function of the behavior. So am I am I putting these flowers in my office to make a, a client like me or to get praise? Or am I doing putting these flowers in my office so the client client can rest their eyes on something beautiful and peaceful and alive, maybe when they're having a difficult moment. Yeah. And that that function of the the behavior is the same, but the function of the behavior can really change my my experience. And I may feel more satisfaction in putting the flowers in my office and less freak out when they die. <laughs> right. And we can yeah. feel it in almost any moment. One pathway is make a connection, not an impression. So one of the things we can do is to deliberately try to go through the world. And every time we see ourselves, you know, with that impulse to make an impression, see, well, what if I really tried to connect instead and connecting in a way that's going to help the other person to relax so that their own social comparison instincts won't be so activated so they can feel okay being an ordinary human being and then you know all this love flows it's, it's just very sweet because nobody's proving anything to anybody and there's almost always an opportunity to do that in almost everything um that we do now some endeavors make it easier than others i was i was talking to a guy it was it was my wife's um high school reunion actually and and he was a banker and I forget what we were talking about, but uh, oh, we were talking about uh, uh, supervising psychotherapists over Zoom. And, uh, and I had said something like, well, you know, the critical variable isn't Zoom or in person, it's how honest can the supervisee be and how honest can the supervisor be about just how confusing it is to be a psychotherapist and just how often we don't know what we're doing and, and really share, you know, share the challenge of that. Um, and he said, wow, that's so interesting. You know, I just got off a, you know, flying um, uh, over to this reunion and, and emailing and everything was about strategizing with the team about how we were going to make an impression, how mm -hmm. we were going to posture so as to look a certain way. And you're saying your work is mostly about figuring out how not to do that. And well, it, especially since the research shows that therapists that have more self-doubt do better. <laughs> They're better therapists, the therapists that express self-doubt. Because if you go in thinking you know everything, you're in trouble. Um, I, I'm in a, um, I'm learning process-based therapy. 
So that's sort of the next evolution of ACT because you know you can't stay in one acronym too long. And I had done a, um, a sample audio actually for this podcast of doing a network modeling. And I sent it to Joseph Sroach and I was like, I just want to get, you know, let you know, I, I want to get some of your feedback on this. And the feeling of being like in third grade, <laughs> getting a, like a science test back or something or my handwriting yeah. sample, I, I, it kept me up. I was like, oh no, I, it, yeah. I can't believe he's going to lit. And I've been practicing therapy for 15 years. And the and then this feeling of I want to take it back. I don't want anyone to listen to it. I'm so afraid I did it because I kind of did do it wrong because <laughs> I'm learning it. Of course I did it wrong. And there's this is a therapy that's still being figured out and formulated. There isn't really a right yet. We're still figuring out what the right is. But that that is so our tendency or my tendency is to do the impression management and redo it and then get it to the point where it's as quote perfect as possible. Yeah. And then I'll send it to the supervisor to review. Yeah. And, and the fantasy is then I'll always be able to keep the good feeling of looking good, being successful, yeah. meeting the whatever our internal criteria is, and I'll be able to avoid that horrible sinking feeling. And, right. uh, you know, uh, we spend whole lifetimes trying to do this and uh, it, it's so much unnecessary suffering. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I mentioned that I was interviewing uh, Steve Hayes and, and uh one of the realms I've been um, uh, uh, learning about is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. And one of the almost universal experiences that comes out of work with psychedelics is this profound sense of the utter folly of trying to build ourselves up this way, the mm -hmm. utter folly of going through life, you know, desperately trying to be seen in a certain way um, and the like. And, you know, our tremendous fear of, feeling shame associated with, you know, just being an ordinary human being trying to figure it out and often feeling <laughs> quite confused and, 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 and uh, lost no matter how experienced we might be at something. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. Getting the ego self to step aside for a bet when you're doing psychedelic psychotherapy and then that, it, and then it, that kind of is sustained for people. It doesn't necessarily end when the, um, experience the journey ends. well that well that's that's uh, you know that's the sixty thousand dollar question which mm -hmm. is how to optimize making that then part of life as opposed to well that was an interesting experience right. and now i'm going to go back to um, my self-esteem roller coaster and trying desperately to look good enough right yeah um, and but, we see it with lots of things, folks that have near like close call death experiences or mm -hmm. when you lose a family member. So, you know, someone gets really sick, you start to realize, oh, this is what's really important to me. When you get fired from a job, like the, the sometimes it's almost like the big hits in life that help you realize that yeah. you just want the ordinary life. Yeah. Like the ordinary life sounds good. <laughs> I well, don't need all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you're talking about something really interesting. You know, a friend of mine, um, pointed out, he said, you know, uh, I, I know a lot of people have been ruined by success, not that many that have been ruined by failure, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the success can just addict us further to these brass rings, whereas the failure usually makes us very consistent with act, ask, well, what really matters here? You know, what matters in, in living a life? And that usually brings us back to some form of ordinariness. The other thing that the failure can do which is a really important aspect of this, you know, beyond noticing it, beyond making a connection, is can we use every disappointment, every narcissistic or self-esteem collapse as an opportunity to rework the trauma from previous collapses? Uh, to give you an example, um, so I, um, I, I have the privilege of, of participating as a speaker in conferences uh, from time to time. And uh, I was involved in one, and typically there's the um, uh, some kind of reception for the speakers. And I was at one of those receptions, and I started getting the feeling that the people who were super famous in our field, who everybody knows their name, were kind of gravitating toward one another, and I was feeling a bit left out, right? And you know, starting to feel the pain of it and, you know, the impulse, oh, I'll join the conversation, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, let me, let me become part of this so I can feel like I'm in the in group, not in the out group. Um, but I took a moment to say, all right, so what's this sinking feeling about? 
close my eyes just for a second and realize, oh, there it is. You know, I was back as a um, as a kid of maybe age 10 or so. And my brother was a young adolescent who's a few years older than me. And he and his friends were kind of tolerating me tagging along, but clearly it was tolerating. I wasn't part of the, you know, the early adolescent group. And and I felt it. And and that was painful then. And using the current moment as a chance to dip into these things that are painful and that we push out of awareness, using each time we have another little self-esteem collapse to inquire, okay, what does this remind me of? Right. And and how maybe have I spent an entire lifetime trying to avoid this feeling? And when we do that, when we when we revisit it with adult and caring adult eyes, um, it it reduces the intensity of this. Uh, it, it, it's not going to go away because we have all this inherited propensity to compare ourselves to others, et cetera. But we get more flexibility when we're not afraid of the pain associated with with a loss or, or a collapse. And we get less and less afraid of that and more and more courageous by opening to the memories when they're when they're triggered by the current thing. So I- interestingly, this project of becoming ordinary is actually a you know it's it's actually a, a rich and varied psychotherapeutic pro- project of dealing with you know all the injuries that we've had throughout a life that were um, that were maybe too much for us to uh, fully let in at the time. Yeah, well, conferences are the worst. Academic conferences are the worst for if you want to feel really bad about yourself, go to an academic conference, and every single early wound will will show up. <laughs> Everything from, you know, for me, because I'm not a researcher and I go to these research conferences and I present amongst researchers, but my little name tag says Diana Hill private practice, uh, which is like, oh, the embarrassment next to yeah. I don't have a, even a university to put my name, you know, behind yeah. or next to you to say that I'm important in some way. Right. Just the the name tag, what you put on your name tag. And it makes me think about, because I just was talking to Richard, Richard Schwartz in inter- Internal Family Systems, and he was talking about, you know, all the parts. And you had, you had written about a little bit about him in, in your book as well of, yeah, it's those old parts yeah. that have gone into exile. And then we, you know, create these, prote- you know, as he would talk about, firefighters and managers or his whole IFS system around it or an act. We would talk about it in, you know, in, in a different way of experiential avoidance, the ways in which we avoid that feeling. But it all does boil down to noticing, oh, there's that feeling and it's quite familiar. Yeah. <laughs> this I is mean, an old feeling. And then right. now look at all the ways I'm posturing myself as an adult Yeah, to try and boost myself, to fluff my feathers, to be able to fit in. And the harder I work at it, sometimes even the more empty it feels because I don't, you know, so I'm putting everything I can at this and it, it's not going away. Or maybe yeah. I get it for a moment and then it goes away. I get right. I get important because someone important talks to me or invites me to dinner. But then the next night I'm having dinner alone in my hotel room at the conference. And isn't that it? I hope no one sees that, like me getting the takeout, yeah. taking it up to my room. <laughs> You know, no, I know. It's like the shame. You know, it's the like shame. Sat, you know, it's Saturday night in high school, and I wonder where all the other kids are. And exactly. at least I grew up at a time where, thank God, I didn't see it on social media. The poor kids now, they actually see where all the other kids are right. on social media, and it's even more heartbreaking. But, um, and there's a, there's a huge silver lining in all this because in the moments when, when we give up, Right when we stop trying to win at this game, and we find increasing—I mean, just the conversation we're having now—I so appreciate your sharing the experience in the conference, and and yes, eating at the in the hotel room alone, and all all of these things. But when, but you know the moment of oh you too, oh what a sweet relief, right? And and we also then get to have a friend right cuz cuz this is the stuff that real friendship is made out of right is is the these shared um experiences and the willingness to share them so uh you know so a lot of it is just trying to steer our ship in a direction that can inch us towards sanity here my friend uh, uh Terry Real who does a lot of he's a couples therapist does a lot of uh thinking about this topic, he says, uh, what he does is every time he finds himself inflating, mm-hmm. it's like a balloon. He tries to just tug, 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 see if he can pull the balloon down. And every time he finds himself, you know, collapsing, 
pull up a little bit and realize that you know you you have basic worth as a human being, not because you're better than any other human being, not because you're worse than any other human being, but just because it's our birthright yeah. to be fundamentally lovable as humans. Yeah, Terry's great. I interviewed him a while back, and I always think of him as the perfect uh, person to send a narcissist because he he gets them and he can take them down in That's in a really special. direct really direct yeah. way. Um, so yeah, he's so skilled, so skilled. So the the book Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary it was recommended to me by um, a friend, and I thought, oh, she, you know, she was like, I think th- I think this would be good for you, and I thought, oh. It, yeah, it probably would be really good with all like the high achieving clients that I work with. And she was like, no, mm-hmm. I think this would be good for you. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, okay, I'll try and interview them. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together. I can attest that it helps. It, it, it helps to turn attention to this. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit about uh, a previous book project uh, that I had done with my uh, friend and colleague, Chris Germer. Um, has done a lot in the world of compassion and self-compassion. And uh, we had done this book on wisdom and compassion in psychotherapy. It was actually a, a sort of an offshoot of a, a conference we had um, that the Dalai Lama had come to and uh, did all this investigation about wisdom. And there, there's actually a whole scientific study of wisdom. And uh, the burning question they've been examining for decades is, do people become wiser as they become older? Right. And it's an interesting question because we can think of examples where that's true and examples where it's decidedly not true. Right. Where people double down on their defenses and uh, no, they're not wiser. Um, And the upshot of the research was it depends. And it basically depends on whether during our life we have as an explicit goal developing wisdom. And we don't have to call it wisdom, but, you know, we could call it psychological or spiritual growth and, and or, um, and development. And the same thing seems true with this, which, you know, is certainly, I think, involves wisdom as well, that when we actually turn our attention to not getting addicted to this, but instead um, feeding those instincts that are antidotes to this and that can give us other means to well being, bit by bit, we that's what happens to us. So, you know, we, we can evolve ourselves in a, in, in a direction that's happier, healthier, and, and kind of better for everybody around us. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's a few books that I, I um, consider my bedside table books or my meditation table books. And a lot of them I use to either just as reminders, like I'll spot check, read little, I've read it, I've read it a million times. And then a lot of them are also just, I like the title. Mm. And just reading the title brings me a little bit of peace of mind and wisdom. And mm. so this is one of them, just seeing the title, The Extraordinary Gift of Being Ordinary. Mm. Mm. And my bedside table will be a good title, mm-hmm. just as a reminder, that's all you need. Mm-hmm. Um, I love, um, I like, now, and now I'm really into the Richard Swartz, No Bad Parts. That's another good uh-huh. title. Yeah, that's another great title. Have on your bedside table. Uh-huh. Um, and then, of course, Pema Children's How We Live is How We Die. Yeah. Got another good title. Like you, you could read the whole thing and then just remember that that one little nugget. So, the I'll, extraordinary I'll gift of being list. ordinary. I'll, yeah. I'll add my list of favorite uh, titles. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Jack Cornfield's uh, title "After the Ecstasy, the Laundry." Yeah. For 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 meditators, which is uh, you know like it's not about getting high; it's about how we live our lives. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, any of Jack's are good too. Well, thank you, Dr. Siegel. It's been a pleasure to speak with you about your book and your work, your life's work, and appreciate your humility and sharing your personal side as well in this. Mm, thanks and, so. I, and if I see you at a conference, we can get takeout together and go up to yeah, sounds, <laughs> go find a corner like, in our, our sweatpants. Like a plan. <laughs> sounds like a plan. Th- thanks so much for inviting me in, and thanks for your openness and, and engagement in, uh, in talking about this.